has always been com communicated through the presidency and of course for different issues that we detail the respective ministers will therefore be invited to come and be part of a presser to give details to that that they are responsible for no thank you uh, minister I is there a reason why minister Ntabeni let government interaction with the media and communication with the public on unrest-related issues? Yes, there's a reason that Minister Nchabeni had to lead because Minister Nchabeni at the time was the acting minister in the presidency as we had lost uh, the late minister, may his soul rest in peace, Ubu Jackson Mteng. Therefore, the president had appointed Minister Nshabeni to be the acting minister in the presidency. Therefore, as part of her responsibilities, she had to make sure that the public is kept informed at all decisions that were taken. Are you happy with how government communicated with the public during the unrest? Well, one of the challenges that people complain about is the issue of the languages that we use when we communicate, that we tend to want to behave as if we're only speaking to the learned ones. And that's one of the things that came up strongly during the during this period of COVID, whether uh, also the, the July uh, incidents that were there. So in terms of dealing with the matter, and making sure that clarity is provided to all. I think we tried to rescue the situation. As I said, when July happened, the July incident happened, nobody foresaw what happened. Therefore, as the minister responsible for communications in the time, the first thing I thought about was the radio stations, the towers, SABC, and anything that can be attacked, as we were not sure if this would lead to people that are trying to overthrow government or what. We had to look at all aspects. And of course, others will sit and wait and say, well, we have police that must go and make sure that they deal with the criminals. Others will say, we're waiting for whoever to inform us to come and act. Others in the hospitals will be saying there's a need to deploy many nurses or doctors because we see that people are being harmed. We approached it differently because we didn't anticipate it. This is why having sat together to say, these are the reports. What are our security agencies saying? How do we respond as the economic cluster? And the interventions that we came up with, because as I said, we really had to create a balance be between the saving of the lives and that of the livelihoods. That's why I, I can't get into the specifics, as I said earlier, in terms of what transpired in the security uh, agencies, because I was busy on the economic side. How do we ensure that there's communication in the country, people are not banning or cutting the, 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 the lines that we have? That was the preoccupation as everyone was in panic, trying to make sure that we really salvage the situation in order for South Africans to be able to continue with their normal lives. Is the lack of synergy something that concerned you uh, at the time when ministers were communicating different messages on the unrest in the country? Yes, it concerned us. Not only me, majority of us expressed discomfort, which is why we said, let's take things back to normal. Let there be one communicator that is designated and in and this instance, the cabinet spokesperson. It was because we were getting that, that it's mixed signals. And as I said, even having listened to those colleagues, communicator that is designated and in and this instance, the cabinet spokesperson. It was because we were getting that, that it's mixed signals. And as I said, even having listened to those colleagues, because one is looking at his or her own area, and when the media comes, you are busy attending to another thing. You do not have time to say, let me go and consult the other. You have to provide a response. And that's how they reacted to the, to the matter, which is why after we had centralized the communication, you did not see any of those. Thank you, Minister. I'll move on to your current portfolio. Would you agree with me that extreme inequality 
of the nature found in South Africa has significant human rights impacts? I fully agree with you on that. The, the NGO that I come from emphasizes the importance of equality, even from its founding documents. The Constitution of South Africa talks to that and any other document, whether you go to the National Development Plan and everything, it talks us about being able to make sure that we create that equal society in the areas that we're operating in. And therefore, yes, that really undermines people's rights, which is why as government, day and night, we try to find strategies to ensure that we deal with it, including inviting the private sector that may have its own agenda, but to say, at least these are the basic policies and these are the values that we are driving. When you come to do trade with us, understand that we have this responsibility that we have to carry out and an obligation that must be fulfilled towards the people that we lead. Thank you, Minister. Would you also agree that extreme inequality perpetuates poverty and social exclusion, which in turn could be a key driver for conflict and insecurity in the country? I fully agree, as I said in one of the responses, that if people feel that they're excluded in the economy, they can do anything, which is why we appeal to everyone to say, because others did this, it does not mean it's the right thing. Hence, we talk of the impact that the uprisings had against the economy, the same economy that must service our people. And I said we're also enhancing efforts and interventions to make sure that we address where there were loopholes. Thank you, Minister. Now that you agree with what I have said, um, would you also agree that addressing the inequality problem in South Africa requires government to take extreme measures to level the playing field. I fully agree. Earlier on, I spoke of radical interventions that need to be introduced. Does the idea of radical economic transformation resonate with you as the Minister for Small Business? Yes, the idea of radical socioeconomic transformation resonates so well with me as the minister responsible for a sector that must transform the economy. Therefore, I have no choice. It's not a personal matter only, but I also have an obligation to make sure that I fulfill that that has been enshrined to me by the constitution on the mandate of this department and the national development plan that is our Bible in this government. Other than the the relief funding provided to small businesses. What is it that your ministry has done to ensure that we protect small, medium-sized enterprises owned by South Africans? I didn't get it. If you are saying outside the interventions that I've spoken to, Yes, outside of the inter interven outside outside of the interventions, which included the relief funding by government, are there any other measures that you are considering as the minister to protect South African-owned small, medium-sized enterprises? Thank you so much. Yes, there are interventions. Earlier on, I spoke about product designation that can only be done through the minister responsible for finance. And you are having engagements on that to say at least these products should be sourced from black 
owned small businesses. And this we do because I said we are looking at the current procurement plan that we have, that we do feel that in certain instances is excluding the local products from participating or being uh, having access to, to the markets that we have. The, each, the, the program towards localization that is driven from DTIC and ourselves also seek to enhance those efforts to say we do have a manufacturing capability. Earlier in, I made an example of the Mercedes-Benz to, to, to just showcase that when there's a will and commitment from government, these things are doable. And therefore, we can't continue to drive a consumer-driven economy. We've got to co-create the economy. We've got to localize certain products. And the SMMEs cannot be made, therefore, to then compete with big businesses, which most of them have an added advantage from the countries they come from, incentives and everything that they get to enjoy. We have to build and focus on the local economic development, and that requires us protecting the products that are produced in South Africa, while to an appreciation of the global environment that we are participating in. So yes, we are continuing to engage with the Minister of Finance. We've asked all the provinces to send us the list of the products that are manufactured or found in their, in their provinces in order for them to be included in the list of products that must be designated towards SMMEs. Thank you. COVID-19 COVID has exacerbated um, the challenges that are faced by this sector that you're responsible for. To what extent is government using procurement as a policy tool to ensure wealth distribution, taking into account the unrest in COVID-19, to what extent are you using procurement as government as a policy tool to advance the idea and notion of wealth redistribution? Government has the 30% procurement rule that must go towards uh, local businesses. But also, as I said, we are in a process of reviewing the procurement bill. I said earlier, as we do all of these interventions that we are providing, we have to comply with the PFMA. And therefore, anything outside that without the exemption from national treasury will lead to other undesired results. And that's not something that we want for now. So we continue to engage to say in these areas, please let's make sure that there's a review and it should take into consideration that this wealth has to be shared amongst the people of this land. And we will, once the Minister of Finance has tabled, a cabinet statement will be issued and we will be able to speak openly as the department in terms of the specifics because right now it's still in consultations and it's something that we are not yet privy to if it's approved or not, which is why we can't delve into specifics here. Bear with us, please. Thank you. Um, have you quantified the impact of the unrest as this, the minister in the economic cluster? Have you quantified the impact of the unrest on small businesses in the country? Do you perhaps have a figure? <laughs> Yes, we quantified. In my submission, we even went to an extent of giving the amounts, uh, of course, estimates on the information that we sourced from both the South African Property Owners Association and the Business Leadership South Africa. For example, if we're talking about stock, about 1.5 billion rands was lost. If we're talking about the damages uh, towards properties and equipment, approximately 15 billion rands. And in terms of the businesses, 50,000 informal traders were impacted and 40,000 formal businesses were affected. If I go to the detail of uh, looking at the jobs, according to the reports, uh, again, the references made to approximately 150,000 that had been reported to be lost. And remember, these are jobs lost even though 
we are trying to save others, which means it's a very negative uh, impact. If I were to then on the categories in terms of the retail shops, that are there about 800 of them, they were looted and lost, and 100 of that was completely banned. And this is the negative impact that we're talking about if we're looking at quantifying what we have seen as per the information that came to our disposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you also have the demographic profile of businesses that benefited from the government's relief funding? Yes, we do have uh, that information. In the annex trials that we have circulated, we've spoken to the number, uh, the race, the gender, the geographical spread. But because of Popia, we couldn't therefore issue the names to say Stella benefited. That information, if required, will have to be requested through appropriate measures. The Premier of Houting testified that they have set aside 100 million through the Houting Propeller Fund to assist businesses that were affected by the unrest. Are you aware of this funding? Are you monitoring the disbursements of these funds to small businesses? And lastly, are you also aware that out of these 100 million, only two million has been disbursed thus far. Thank you so much for that question. Yes, I'm aware of the fund that was committed to by Gauteng our government towards assisting small business. Unfortunately for now, I do not have the records of how many have benefited to date. And from our side, we do have those records, as I mentioned. Earlier on, I said, these interventions that we are making, it's not interventions that we just made as just the national government. We said there's a need for us to be coordinated in order to also try to avoid or minimize the misuse of the state resources, wherein we find that other business, small businesses are double dipping, which is why the importance of the establishment of the war rooms was therefore taken to say, let's have these war rooms. We are working together. Therefore, we're able to look at who has gotten what, including those small businesses that had insurance that was paid to them. When we provided the support, and through other means. We provide the support whilst they were still waiting for that insurance and then when the payout, the payout comes and therefore they had to refund the money. And this was done in order to make sure that government fund is properly coordinated and indeed it reaches the intended beneficiaries. I'm aware again that uh, the people have raised concerns of certain red tapes uh, to access uh, some of the funding, and we have tried to engage with those that are, 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 are responsible at that level. In Gauteng, we are engaging with MEC Dao, uh, wherein we're trying to really find uh, alignment in their provincial growth plan and our economic recovery plan as the country. Thank you, Minister. Small business can play a central role in human, economic, and sustainable development in the country. Do you think the budget allocated to your department is enough to address the historical inequalities? To, is it enough to assist in dismantling the apartheid nature of this economy? Well, I indicated earlier that there's a need for more resources that must be put uh, towards this work that we're doing. And yes, I agree with you that uh, the budget that we have is, is just a drop in the ocean, which is why earlier again in my statement, I spoke to the coordination of all the funding mechanisms, especially from government that we have. Right now, you still have um, 
a non-coordinated approach wherein if you're talking about the incidents that we foresee national treasury then allocates two billion rands to DTIC and then we take from our coffers 300 million and I, I mentioned earlier that on the applications that we received there were about 785 which amounted to 657 million that we do not have because from reprioritizing certain funds we managed to get out 300 million this is just an example of the challenges that we face but as I said we are continuing to engage with national treasury at the center of this is building the capability of both the department with its portfolio organizations to make sure that when these funds come, as President Ramaphosa has at least spoken to the Minister of Finance to say he would love to, to ensure that the small businesses at least they get about 50, 50 billion rands worth. And that's not money that can just come if the systems are not in place, if we're not able to utilize existing budgets accordingly. So now we're still cleaning up our house to make sure that we really look into the systems, we get to integrate the systems, looking into the entire ecosystem so that when the money comes, we know that it looks into what you're talking about in terms of addressing not only the imbalances, but making sure that we really invest in our people to be able to manufacture or play a meaningful role in growing our economy. And that means we've got to temper with existing structures, something we're not going to be popular for. But unfortunately, as you read, and the National Development Plan dictates, that is something that we have to do. All of that requires resources, but not only financial resources. It requires us to review the legislations, the regulatory environment that we have. It requires us to make sure that we build capacity amongst the SMMEs in terms of the compliance as they will be accessing funding uh, from government that comes with its rules. But of course, bearing in mind that small businesses can not operate in the same way in terms of certain issues, not in terms of the capability or the quality, but in certain instances, as I made mention, for example, about those that are in the retail. Others will buy more and therefore they'll get more discount because they they, they really consuming large uh, contents. And that is what we are saying we need to look at. Hence, we talk of product designation that must make sure that small businesses can therefore be able to compete with each other whilst they collaborate with big businesses. Thank you, Minister. The, the 3,000 given to informal traders, do you perhaps briefly, Minister, do you have the criteria that was used to... And is this 3,000 enough? Or are you looking at um, increasing it? Well, as I responded to this question earlier, nobody has came to us to say that 3,000 is not enough. Um, I take it that people were appreciative of the fact that it's an intervention that's being made so that they can go back to business. But also in terms of the criterion, as, as, as I explained that different things were put in place, of course, the first thing was to make sure that indeed you are a South African. And the second thing was to make sure that indeed you were in business. And I went to an extent of saying we had asked that uh, they must bring uh, case numbers from the police station, of which later we really had to review that because we later learned that when the, 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 the unrest happened, people just left and they couldn't come back to post to post police offices. But because we are working with local government, they were therefore able through their ward councillors and other stakeholders, they able to say indeed, Ustela was operating here and then we were shown even those uh, demolished areas. And through our local offices, we were therefore able to provide a grant. So that was the criterion that we looked at. Uh, thank you, Minister. G given the, the centrality of business in generating positive value for our people, our economy, and our communities, the Commission will be engaging with you uh, going forward to assist in your policy efforts to uh, transform the economy. Business and human rights is also our focus as the Commission. And thank you, Chairperson and the Minister. Yes, no, it's just a quick follow-up uh, question because um, 
Yeah, Minister, I think uh, when, when, I, when I posed or started asking questions, uh, I, I had highlighted the fact that you had uh, given your response or rather your statement um, with reference to 3.4, which I read out, 3.4 of the terms of reference. Now, having, having heard your answer from Mr. Jones regarding the 30% threshold, which is allocated by government generally uh, towards um, government procurement, and I, and I believe this cuts across uh, uh, all, all, all levels of government, including SOEs, uh, and I'm also noting that there is this procurement bill which you mentioned, which is going to be um, obviously looking at changing the, the manner in which procurement is done. In your view, especially in relation to SMMEs and uh, those that are historically disadvantaged, disadvantaged and, 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 and so on, is 30% allocated to the advancement of historically disadvantaged individuals adequate um, because we know government is the biggest spender in terms of the procurement of goods and services across government and SOEs running in tens and tens of billions of rands. Do you have a, a, a comment to, to, that, to that question, uh, Minister? Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Of course, as government, we had to start somewhere. And therefore, 30% is where we started, but it's not the destination. As I said, the National Development Plan forces us to transform the economy. Because even when you look at that 30%, which services are we spending on? Because people will go and say, we've spent 30% and they're only talking on the superficial business. So we are saying if we are to grow and transform the economy, we really have to invest in other sectors that will really help us not only fight for this meaningful 30% first, but to say, 30% is not enough. It's not adequate. We fully agree with you, but we started somewhere. That's why also the focus is on product based services, that it doesn't matter if it would be 100% of those that will be procured, but as long as they are procured from SMMEs. It can be correct that would say the small businesses that are expected to, to, to really uh, create 9 million jobs by 2030 uh, to say we are happy with 30%. If Really, that's the expectation. It tells you that there's more that needs to be done. Hence, I spoke of the entire ecosystem that we are looking at. Whilst we're looking at government spend, we're looking at the regulatory environment, but we're also looking at ensuring that we teach our people in terms of the compliance that they have to comply with, but also at the same time do away with the red tapes that uh, then exclude our people from participating in certain things. And that product development, as we spoke about the localization on manufacturing and the other things, are what are really going to help us shape and change how things are done. And once we're able to master that, there's no reason that government can say they do not have uh, confidence in giving SMM is 50% because it is this government that has shown will that small businesses have really to be elevated and supported throughout the ecosystem. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Th thank you, uh, Chair and panel. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Advocate Lord. Uh, Commissioner Nassim. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. I just got about three questions. The first one is maybe you have mentioned it, but the issue of spaza shops. And coupled with that, uh, we've seen that within the townships, in particular with the spaza shops, there are a number of them being owned by non nationals. And part of your criteria here is that ex excludes non nationals. Uh, could you comment on that? Uh, I'm Nationals. Uh, could you comment on that? Uh, I'm not sure if you want me to comment on the fact that we have majority of other shops owned by non-nationals, or you want me to comment on the criteria that we introduced? Criteria, Minister. 
well, the criteria looked at uh, really helping South Africans to go back to business. And therefore, we hoped that any body outside that would have had other measures to ensure that the business is not only protected as they also did not foresee that that is coming. And as I said, DTIC also was providing support. So as we did not provide the site, others were able to go to DTIC, uh, which had to look into certain areas that they needed to look at. But strictly from our side, like South Africans, apart from voting and, it's in, and a few others, but they do have access to health, to, um, to education, etc. cetera. Um, why would they be excluded as a small informal business from and not be included in this criteria? Well, um, if you look into the work that's being done by the Department of Home Affairs, uh, in relation to foreign-owned businesses, the, the, there is uh, an issue that looks into the permits um, that per provision of the Immigration Act that they must adhere to. And those that are catered for are those that are investing a minimum of 5 million rands. And that's the Department of Home Affairs that's responsible for that. Now, when it comes to us, we're responsible for the criteria that I outlined earlier. I said this is a, a, a very, um, you can say three-legged, or but it's, it's, it's not only the Department of Small Businesses that has a responsibility over this. Hence, I spoke about the coordination of all the government interventions, including private sector, towards um, the interventions that we're making uh, for small businesses. So the spaza shops, as much as they belong to to, 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 to the Department of Small Businesses, but they're not exempted if they are not, they are owned by non-nationals because there's immigration acts that forces certain things that must be in place. Thank you, Minister. Minister, you mentioned the 9 million jobs. Are we talking about um, in the various, in the informal sector, uh, et cetera, around whether it's a Chisanyama or with the salons or whatever, are we talking about 9 million jobs that are existing, or are we saying that's the target? You also mentioned the 11 million jobs by the end of 2030, and I'll come to that. But just want to know, the 9 million jobs that we're talking about in the informal center, uh, sector, is it already created, or are you going to add to that, or is that the target that your department has? Well, the 9 million that I spoke about is what the National Development Plan dictates must happen. The National Development Plan says by 2030, at least 11 million jobs will be created. And out of those 9 million will be created through the SMMEs. And this is the target that I'm talking about, that when we call for more resources towards the small business development and the access to market, it means means that we really have to enhance our efforts to make sure that indeed we do not fail the, 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 the goals or the targets that are set in the National Development Plan. So that's a 2030 uh, target as, 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 as mandated by the National Development Plan. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Minister. My last, my last um, question, oh, just which you can comment to, because I don't expect you to, to answer it, but if you can comment on it. Uh, you've mentioned that the uh, National Development Plan is government's Bible. Uh, in earlier you said it's government's Bible, we treat it as a Bible. So then the Bible requires obedience and dedication. Um, and I assume that will, this, this plan also will require obedience and dedication. We've got eight years left of the National Development Plan because we said by, 20, by 2030, or thereabout, we will achieve the following. Now, economists and analysts are saying that we are far behind in the 2030 um, the deadline that we set for this Bible. Now, I just want to know your comment on it, Minister. Are there any plans or any attempts to fast track, and particularly from your own side, because you, you have mentioned, Minister, that we've all heard throughout this hearing is that unemployment, inequality, and poverty were a ripe minefield for anyone to instigate or to, or to, to lure them into what we've seen in July. 
And so we are, we've got eight years left of this that we need to fulfill. So what are your comments on it, Minister? Thanks. Thanks. Firstly, let me explain that when the National Development Plan was drafted, none of us foresaw the emergence or the outbreak of the COVID-19 that has really delayed us uh, in, 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 in undertaking certain responsibilities, including the July unrest that we're talking about. But as much as, as I say that, there is commitment in government, which is why we say there's a need for the review of the targets so that we are impactful and not only chase numbers. Uh, we don't want to be hit and run. We want to make sure that the sustainability on the jobs that we are creating. Hence, government came up with an economic reconstruction and recovery plan to say these are the key drivers of the economy and therefore what are the support mechanisms that we must put in place. As I'm speaking to you, a report was re released last week. Uh, I remember on the informal settlement, it was showing growth in terms of the jobs that were created through the informal uh, businesses. And this is what we're talking about, that when we are able to collaborate with all stakeholders and coordinate our efforts, we're able to reach the target that we want to reach, including uh, supersede some of them. There's many people that have spoken who then uh, indicated that the picture is gloomy. You look at the IMF ratings, you look at them when they then foresaw that we're going to reach 2.6 uh, percentages on the growth of the economy, and we surpass those. These are all because of the coordinated efforts. And as you correctly say that, I made a mistake of saying the NDP is a government plan. It's a country plan. It's a country plan, but government, of course, builds from it as though it was developed at government level, but that's a plan that enjoyed support of the majority of the South Africans in terms of the sectors, which is why we always emphasize the ANC government, that as government, we shouldn't even develop policies as if we are inward looking. The policies that we develop are policies that must look at the wider sector that we are leading, the private sector, our communities, and therefore government to achieve the socio-economic responsibilities that we have as government. So yes, we may not meet the target, but what I'm emphasizing, now learning from where we are, having an appreciation of the different economy that COVID has sprung us into, we have no time to waste. We were fast-tracked, if you want to put it like that, but if we deploy the resources where it matters and we collaborate with, with each other, we're able to reach the target. As I'm speaking to you, only 30% is contributed by government to GDP in terms of what we have through the state-owned agencies and the departments. 70% contribution towards the GDP is by the private sector, which means whatever that we want to do, we can't do it alone as government, but we can say we're leveraging on the state capability in order to enhance the efforts and create an enabling environment for investors and the private sector not only to blossom, but to co-create with the locals that we have that must be part of this economy that we're talking about. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you, Minister. That's all, Chairperson. Thank you. The Minister of Small Business Development, Stella Ndabeni Abrams, uh, at the uh, national investigative hearings into the July 2021.